Good morning. Unfortunately, we are experiencing some technical difficulties and unable to offer a Spanish translation this morning. Um, for those of you, I apologize. There will be Spanish translation of the presentation itself, which will be posted to our website later today. Trustee, uh, excuse me, President Haug, if you would like to continue, we're now live on Channel 27 and YouTube. So oh, good morning. I'd like to call this meeting to order. The time is 9.09. .09. Welcome to a special meeting of the Board of Trustees of the San Elena Unified School District. Today is Monday, July 20th, 2020. I am Maria Haug, Board President. I would like to introduce my fellow trustees through roll call. When you hear your name, please respond with here. Lisa Pelosi. Here. Julio Olguin. Here. Jeannie Kerr. Here. Jeff Conwell. Here. Joe Brody. Here. I would also like to introduce our district staff attending in person. Superintendent Dr. Mary Lou Wilson. Good morning. Chief Academic Human Resources Officer, Mr. Christopher Heller. Good morning. Chief Business Official, Ms. Mrs. Andrea Stubbs. Good morning. Director of Curriculum and Instruction, Mrs. Mary Allen. Good morning. Executive Assistant to the Superintendent and Governing Board, Ms. Erica Madrigal. Good morning. And our IT Systems Analyst, Mr. Derek Machado. We are delighted that you are viewing on Channel 27 or our YouTube channel. A copy of this board meeting video will also be available on our website at www.sthelenaunified.org. I will entertain a motion to approve the agenda for this meeting. I'll make a motion to approve. Do I have a second? I'll second. Dr. Wilson, please call the roll. Yes, Trustee Browdy. Aye. Trustee Conwell. Trustee Conwell? Aye. Trustee Ogeen? Aye. Trustee Kerr? Aye. Trustee Pelosi? Aye. Trustee Haug? Aye. Motion carried. Please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. So on to item 4A, student learning and achievement, the approval of the 2020-2021 reopening SHUSD school plans during COVID-19. I would like to turn the uh, agenda over to Dr. Mary Lou Wilson. There we are. Good morning, board members. We have a presentation for you this morning that is a, a little bit on the lengthy side, and that's with intention. We want to show you um, the complexity, the continued complexity of running school during COVID-19, and also the work of the district today. What you see on the screen right now is our primary goal, and that is to provide school for our students every day, five days a week. We need to do that when our public health conditions allow, and that's in um, contingency of state and local orders, along with collaboration with our bargaining units, our teachers and our classified team. 
Today, um, we have a number of outcomes that we are working towards. We intend that you will have a better understanding of the executive orders, that you'll understand the work and the recommendations from our transition team, that you will understand the models that we have for reopening school. Uh, you'll learn more about the work that has been completed to prepare for our in-person learning, have a better understanding of the health and safety recommendations, understand the business aspects of opening our schools, and understand staff recommendations um, and discuss those recommendations for reopening. A few updates for you. Uh, infection rates in our county, our state, and the nation continue to increase. Napa County and many other counties have reverted to more shelter at home restrictions. We do have a guidance from the Napa County uh, Office of Education and the Public Health Department for reopening schools that we were able to use in our models. There's conflicting guidance right now between our state and federal government. And as of Friday, July 17th, all of you received the press release that went out. Um, Governor Newsom mandated that counties on the state monitoring list, which we are on, must provide instruction in a distance learning model. So what we have for you today is a phased re-entry approach to um, uh, opening our schools. And this is based on the health conditions and the orders. So phase one is now. And Mr. Heller will talk lots more about this in a few minutes, but I wanted for you to see um, and the public to see where we are now early on in this presentation. So phase one, a robust distance learning, uh, learning opportunity for students who intend to join us in person as quickly as we are able to. And then a virtual learning program for students and parents who choose remote learning for the entire school year. Phase two, which will be later when we're able, uh, an in-person approach with either a hybrid or a full five day a week program. And the virtual learning program will continue for the entire school year. And then phase three, if we're not able to go into that five full day in phase two, then we would be in that five full day in-person program for the remainder of the school year and the virtual learning program would continue. There are a lot of names on this next screen. This is our transition team. And I just wanna give a huge thank you to every member of this team in different aspects. They have um, conducted research. They have uh, worked with uh, staff members and teachers and classified employees. Uh, lots of work has been accomplished to um, get us to where we are today. And I want to thank each member of our transition team. The work that the team has accomplished truly since um, late February, early March, they have met regularly. We have read, we've analyzed, we've worked diligently to understand all of the guidance that we've received. We've looked at parent and staff survey data. We've um, been making lots of purchases for health and safety items. They have been able to identify and are today recommending models for that remote, hybrid, and in-person learning. We're working on developing public safety announcements that will help our community in understanding COVID-19 and how to prepare for school under um, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. They've worked to make sure that our students have access to food um, during the school year and also during the summer right now. They've made sure that we have transportation ready and available and it will meet safety protocols. And um, they've worked to you know, receive those updates from the state and local uh, guidances, data trends and directives. Public health requirements for schools. This is out of the Napa County um, Office of Education guidance. And what you see here is a bit of a continuum. So the organizing principle for our lower upper elementary is that we have stable cohorts. And the organizing principle for our middle to high school is that there is physical distancing and face coverings. And what you'll see is we're going to spend lots of time talking about our in-person models because truly that's where we want to be. Public health requirements um, that we must follow in opening schools, our teacher and staff desks must be at least six feet away from students to minimize that adult to child disease transmission. 
we must assign stable seating arrangements um, and work to ensure that students are um, con not contacting other students in other classrooms. We must increase ventilation uh, and increase outdoor air circulation. And all of our staff are required to wear face coverings and they may also wear a face shield. At the elementary le levels, we need to maintain that stable cohort that I mentioned earlier, staying with the same teachers. The students should not mix with the other stable cohorts and students in grades three through 12 must wear face coverings. At the middle school and the high school, we need to min minimize or maximize risk by um, ensuring that the desks um, are spaced as much as possible. And all of the students will need to wear um, face masks, as I said earlier. Board members, at this time, it's an opportunity for any clarifying questions with regards to the public health orders. Fellow no. board members, are there any questions? No, I don't. No, I don't. Thank you. All right. Then what I'm going to do is um, move the, the presentation over to uh, Mr. Heller. Great, thank you. Everybody can hear me okay, correct? Yes, great, thank you. Uh, good morning, board members and, and St. Helena community. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit today about the work that we've done in developing and designing learning plans for the fall. Uh, and this, I wanted to like to start with uh, Senate Bill 98, which was amended on June 29th of this year, that had several modifications related to education funding. But a couple of the factors we need to consider are you know, the methods for recording daily attendance and descriptions of distance learning services for special education students, including protections for our uh, medically fragile students. Uh, next, please. Using uh, the Senate bill as a guide, district staff considered many factors in designing models of learning for the fall. Among those listed were feedback from stakeholders, uh, students, pat, parents, and staff, uh, attendance considerations, how we're gonna monitor and uh, collect attendance on a daily basis, what our grading practices will look like, and again, our, our support for what are called our most vulnerable students, the ones that are going to potentially have the most difficulty in an out-of-school placement, our special education and English learners. Uh, one of the biggest considerations that we, we wanted to ensure was that all three models that we propose are very uh, easily able to transition effectively from one model to another, depending on conditions related to COVID, so that the distance learning, the hybrid, and the in-person models all have a very similar schedule in their design. Uh, the work and support of SHTA uh, the Teachers Association, led by President Brandon Farrell, really moved our discussions quickly from concepts into the three models that we're going to present and review later. Our collaboration and schedule design illustrated the great partnership that we have with our bargaining units to serve our students in the, in the best manner possible. And to further that discussion, I'd like to provide uh, President Brandon Farrell an opportunity to provide some input and comments from the SHTA perspective. Uh, Mr. Farrell? Um, just doing a little quick check to see if everyone can hear me. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you and uh, good morning. Um, I want to start by saying that, you know, this has been quite a process uh, for everyone. Uh, our teachers, you know, uh, you know, you know, jumped into action uh, in the middle of March and has have been working towards the end of the school year uh, with the eye on this year coming back to school. And, um, you know, I'd like to, a little bit, uh, to talk a little bit about that. So um, our collaboration process since the beginning of March has been um, a very robust process, to be quite honest with you. We've worked uh, hand in hand with the district. Um, they've given us a lot of opportunities to give them input. Um, and we've worked um, tirelessly to try to come up with plans uh, looking for forward to this fall. Our uh, 
you know, we can't thank the support staff enough, the district administration, uh, the people that have helped us along the way, uh, the student engagement um, and the understanding of parents through the th through that spring was was also a, a highlight for us. We want to um, do everything we can uh, as we move into this fall to to be back into in person learning. Um, but at the same time, as things with the COVID-19 pandemic have changed, we realize that this is becoming ever so difficult. Uh, in the eyes of our teachers. So our teachers are, are you know, anxiously eager to teach with students in front of them, as I would always imagine, but this whole process is causing us to rethink and re, uh, collab, you know, collaborate how, how we're going to do our process. Um, you know, our teachers were surveyed at the beginning of June, and honestly, about 70% of them were, were, you know, prepared or felt more prepared to come back and, and work in front of students. In the last month, as, as things have changed, as everybody has mentioned so far, um, some of that, uh, you know, anxiety has increased within our staff. Um, you know, to put, it, to put it bluntly, we have 20 kids at the TK5 level uh, all day that are very inexperienced with PPE and, and things that um, you have to do to, to um, you know, to be inside and in, indoors in the classroom. At the secondary level, we deal with between 75 and 100 kids inside every day. Um, and those things are, are somewhat terrifying for our teachers. Um, at the same time, we understand that the best education is delivered in front of students. Um, so we definitely have been working with the, the, the district to develop plans that can model um, each other from robust distance learning to all the way to in-person um, attendance and full five-day attendance learning. So we can jump back and forth when necessary. Um, you know, obviously our, our position is that we want to make sure that we are doing things safe. Um, the when is just as important as the how. And uh, for us as a teaching staff, um, you know, we are eager to get back into the classroom, but we also are eager to, our, you know, to express that we have some uh, reservations, um, you know, through this whole process. Uh, I'd also like to commend Andy Stubbs uh, and the business operations uh, side of this because um, as I look through CTA, uh, different school districts, we're, we're providing as much or as, you know, PPE and um, safety precautions to get students back into the uh, classrooms as soon as possible. Uh, I want to thank the collaboration between all of the transition team and all of the um, district level administrators with the teachers because they've given us a lot of opportunities for feedback. Uh, we meet regularly and um, I'm probably taking a little bit too much time right now, but that's kind of where our teachers are, are feeling. I think that um, you know, like I said, I, you know, this is a, an incredibly difficult situation. Um, we understand the role that we have as teachers in this community and kind of and what we provide, um, and we want to honor that. But we also have, um, you know, our own personal um, things to take care of as well. So thank you. Thanks, Brandon. All right. Uh, so okay. Entonces. El Consejo Educacional puede recordarse que la reunión de junio conversamos el modelo híbrido y se nos dio la dirección eh, eh, de escuchar lo que decía el cuestionario para que, saber qué es lo que querían los padres. Y hicimos esas preguntas y varias otras preguntas pertinentes en el segundo cuestionario con 532 respuestas y vamos a la siguiente diapositiva, van a ver que Uh, I've just been informed that we do have me informaron que si tenemos servicios eh, de interpretación en, en español para esas familias que están interesadas, eh, si pueden eh, clicar en el eh, enlace, va a, va a haber interpretación en español. Voy a pausar por, para que eso suceda. Great. Okay. 
Maravilloso. Entonces, la primera pregunta, manteniendo en mente las condiciones que han cambiado muchísimo. Um, the response here was, I would prefer my, the schedule for next fall to be, uh, and 53% selected 100% regular school day. So knowing that the conditions have changed, I'm not certain that that same data would apply today. Uh, but, you know, if you think back to our first survey, we had about 65 to 70% of our parents that do want a regular school day, and that's dropped down to 53. So, you know, there is a, an eye to having our students in school as much as possible from the parents' angle as well. And so that uh, helps promote the district's uh, angle of trying to uh, establish 100% regular school day as soon as possible. On the second slide, if remote learning was selected, I would like my students on Zoom or Google Meet with their teacher. And this was to get a sense of how much time parents would prefer to have their children uh, in front of a laptop and connecting with their teachers on a daily basis. We also recognize that uh, the, the question does vary from TK, uh, kindergarten levels, primary students, all the way to high school. And so that the responses may be different for uh, children of a small age versus having a junior or a senior. Uh, but the, the general consensus, you know, made us feel that you know, one to three hours was about an appropriate range with 70% of the response. And that helped us design uh, some of the schedules that you'll see when it comes to distance learning. The third question was related to the hybrid schedule. And in the development of the hybrid schedule, uh, the majority of the response came to having a student in attendance in two to three days a week. Uh, with remote learning occurring the other two to three days. Uh, the, the other two models of having students in two to three hours on a daily basis or having students attend one week followed by a, a week off uh, of remote learning uh, didn't garner as much as having students in uh, attendance two to three days a week. So that's the model that we proceeded with that I'll share with you here shortly. And then the fourth question, if the district had regular daily school, what concerns you the most about safety? We recognize that all three of these are important factors in our personal, um, you know, in our safety for the school, for everyone's uh, comfort level. Uh, what the district's intent was here is to just see if there was any one particular factor that would be more important than the others. And you can see by the pie chart that it was split pretty evenly into thirds. So all three of those remain uh, high concerns. And so we'll, continue to address those equally. And the last question is if the district offered 100% remote learning for the first semester trimester, uh, you know, through a credential teacher and accredited online program, would you like to keep your child at home? And 40% of the respondents said yes. And so that gave the district uh, an eye on developing uh, some sort of accredited program uh, that would be an option for families to choose in the fall. So we'll talk more about that here in a second. Um, again, uh, reiterating what Dr. Wilson opened with that, you know, in these models of instructional delivery, we, we developed three of them. Uh, but you can see that the full distance learning one is required at this time. And so this is this is the model. And this is the one that we'll will open with, uh, because it is the one that we'll be using this fall. Uh, and talking about the, the uh, full distance learning model for uh, fall opening. So next slide. So uh, begin the conversation a little bit in, with that question number five on the survey. Uh, we're, we're pursuing options for a virtual uh, learning program for students. And so we have several uh, different programs that we would like to partner with. We haven't completed that process yet in collecting more information and establishing a, a partnership. Uh, but we have a few that we will be researching here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, applicants would enroll in this program and it would be for the full school year. So the district can provide staffing and classroom sizes for students in the return to school program based on class capacity. That is, once we know that a certain number of students would elect to enroll in the virtual learning program, that gives us the in-person uh, total of students that we can start aligning our staffing with to with the eye on returning students uh, into classes and maximizing the capacity that's available. So families that are interested in this virtual learning program, uh, we'll provide more information in the next couple of weeks uh, to families about what it looks like, 
Uh, we'll post information on the website regarding enrollment and um, any other uh, opportunities to, to answer questions that we might have. That'll be done here in the next couple of weeks. So slide 22, uh, you know, thinking about distance learning for the fall, uh, we, you know, when we closed school on March 13th, we quickly implemented online learning. And it wasn't something that I would say that any school district or our teaching staff was prepared, prepared for because we just didn't have the experience in doing it. Uh, but, you know, if you think about the spring as being our distance learning 1.0 model, uh, we've had time to provide uh, staff, uh, staff development for teachers at the end of the school year. Uh, they've had an opportunity to reflect and discuss with colleagues of ways that we can revamp it. And we're looking forward to, you know, practicing our distance learning in a revised, expanded, I guess, 2.0 model for the fall. Uh, if we go next slide. Uh, the distance learning for students. So from a student perspective, if you're a student tuning in today, uh, attendance would be taken on multiple opportunities in a small group or uh, a, a daily attendance uh, model. So students are expected to go to school every day. Uh, grades would be reinstituted for this year, so there would be not a credit, no credit option, but their letter grades would be back in uh, practice for teachers, and teachers will communicate those individual expectations for students, what that may look like. That is, their, their syllabi and syllabus from last year is going to need to be refined and remodeled to accommodate distance learning and the expectations on how students can achieve certain grades. So in, in addition to that, teachers are gonna modify their curriculum because uh, it will look different um, and they're gonna have to look at different ways and methods of uh, delivering the curriculum to maximize their instruction. So if we take a look at a sample schedule of TK5, uh, you can see on this distance learning model, there's time for whole group, small group, and individual student contact. Uh, each day looks very similar. Uh, where it says at home study time, that is a part of the student school day where they're expected to work on assignments independently. Uh, and during that time, uh, teachers will not be uh, available to check in with students, but they will be expected to continue their work on their assignments. Uh, each of the small core groups will be broken into uh, A, B, or C, and that will be dictated by the teacher's need to uh, deliver certain core subjects or advance uh, any topics that they discuss within the large group topics of language arts or mathematics as needed. So every day students will have opportunities to connect with their teachers via Zoom and uh, teachers will dictate when students will report back to them to, for additional work during that day. And if we take a look at the next slide, this is a sample of what it would look like in the secondary level, grades six through 12. Uh, this would be conducted in a block period format, uh, time built in for study and access period for teachers to work with students in small groups. In addition, open access is available at 1115 on Tuesday and Friday uh, for teachers to schedule students individually or small groups for additional assistance as needed. On slide 26, this looks very similar to the previous slide. Uh, right now, the district and SHT are having discussions about uh, expanding into an eight period day. And what this would do was ex would spread the teacher contacts uh, over eight periods where they would teach six of those periods instead of five within a seven period model. Uh, the idea behind this is that as we think about the number of students that are available for in-person learning and maximizing the time that we have available by spreading out the students throughout the day, uh, we could make our class sizes even smaller, which would enable our return to school in a full capacity, potentially more uh, easily accommodated uh, than if we had a seven period day. And this would look a little different uh, if we were in stage two or late stage two and, and stage three. So uh, again, we're continuing this. So I wanted to make sure that this was introduced as an option if we were able to achieve this. Uh, we both have a mutual interest in, in taking a look at this model to see if it is something that we can achieve. This doesn't affect, uh, if we go back real quick, students would uh, enroll in six periods, uh, excuse me, seven periods, and they wouldn't have to, um, don't worry about it. Okay. 
So students don't have to, uh, they'll have an open period during this model at some point. So it wouldn't be an expectation that students would increase the number of uh, classes that they would have to attend, nor does it change their graduation requirements. So uh, no adjustments are needed on the student or parent end at this point. This is purely a model to help reduce the number of student contacts within our class sizes. And then in slide 27, uh, taking a look at that hybrid model that we uh, received the feedback on, we, we de decided to uh, divide populations into halves. Uh, that would be group A and group B. And this would allow two, two days of in-person instruction, which would be Monday and Tuesday for group A and Thursday and Friday for group B. Um, on, you know, students would continue to receive distance learning on Wednesdays. And it potentially opens the opportunity for us to start uh, restoring some of our class sizes for our vulnerable populations that we discussed earlier with our English learners and our special education populations to be able to come back to school a little bit earlier just to receive more individualized attention and support that they might need. In the, so this, you'll see in the schedules here, it's, it's very similar um, that uh, group A will report on Monday and Tuesday uh, for their daily instruction in block period formats. Uh, we have math in the morning, language arts midday, and social studies and science prior to lunch. And lunch would provide a dismissal uh, with a grab and go lunch for students. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like. Uh, but students would have a lunch break to collect their lunch and then uh, not necessarily remain on campus to get on transportation or you know, walk home at that point. Uh, but on the days that group A is in class, you could see at 140, group B would be required to check in with their teacher in the afternoon in that attendance model that I previously outlined. And then students would have additional study time at home in the afternoon. If we continue on to uh, grades 6 through 12, again, the period format would be a, a block period format. Uh, group A would attend on Monday and Tuesday and group B would attend on Thursday and Friday. You can see that there's a check-in time for the alternating group in the afternoon beginning at two o'clock. And on Wednesdays, all periods would meet in a very uh, truncated format for about 35 minutes to connect with their teachers on those, on those particular days. And that would be remote learning. Grades six through 12 uh, with the eight period model. Again, this is just where you saw access earlier on Tuesdays and Fridays, uh, period eight is inserted there. And again, that fits with that eight period proposal that we're working on. And then 30, oh, so then uh, again, we're working towards the in-person five days a week. Um, we, we need to see improved health and safety conditions. Um, the difference in schedules would reduce the school day to release students at lunchtime. Uh, students would have the option again for a grab and go lunch prior to departure and we would have school bus transportation as well. So on slide 32, the uh, block format would look like this for grades TK5. Uh, they are longer blocks of time, so math in the morning, language arts, social science, much like the hybrid model uh, that we saw earlier, and then your dismissal time on those particular days are 123. So in the in the in-person school models, I just want to to highlight and share with uh, the board and, and the community that the days are truncated uh, quite a bit. Uh, the, the idea of students congregating at lunchtime or at recess are things that we have to consider in keeping our, our cohorts very uh, separate and uh, contained with one another. And those are things that we're gonna continue to explore with principals on uh, ways that we can continue to do that for our student populations that while they're at school, it's gonna be about, you look at it as a five hour day, and then at lunchtime, students are dismissed to go home and, and have lunch. So uh, the, the school that we saw in the fall and in our experience or in previous years, it would look very different in this in-person schedule. So I wanna make sure to uh, make the community and the board aware of that. The next slide uh, has the block periods. Again, you can see it's kind of, very similar to the other formats that we've had in the secondary schedule. Uh, there is on Tuesdays and Fridays, again, the access period. 
uh, right before lunch. And, you know, that poses some of the, the logistical questions and concerns that we had about mixing students again into another uh, spot where uh, more students are being uh, around one another. And so where we have on the next slide that period eight time that might mitigate some of that additional uh, exposure that students would have to a new group or student cohort. So those are the number of uh, models that we've worked on. I think that's the end of this one. And uh, we'll take opportunities for any clarifying questions that you might have on the schedules or uh, the information I've provided so far. So um, just to clarify for all of our, um, uh, all of our community members and parents that are listening in, the opportunity for clarifying questions is directed to the board uh, the public comment will have an opportunity to uh, present questions during the public comment portion of this meeting. So um, just uh, to clarify that for people who have never attended a school board meeting before, this is in, uh, in accordance with the Brown Act and how we run our school board meetings. So I would like to go to board members. Um, now, do we have an, any clarifying questions on this segment of the presentation? I have a question. Go ahead, Lisa. I, may. Um, I, I, you know, I love the community building uh, time that's built into the hybrid model. I'm wondering, is there any chance of even having that for, particularly for our younger students of TK5, where they can have, even if it's a 15 minute check-in with a, a teacher um, at the start of their day to feel a little more grounded um, and have that connection and then have their at study home time. Um, you know, maybe it's not possible. I just kind of looking at the schedules, I, I know that that was something important to our parent community that having that connection to their teacher. Um, and, and maybe that's built in in that 8.30 time start, but I didn't really know if that was, so I wanted to clarify it. And that, that's a great question because, um, you know, what we're presenting today is really in concept and it could have a lot of variance um, uh, depending on the teacher need. And so while it may not have been overtly written there, uh, those are something, those are things that we can work on with the, the SHTA and the teachers in particular to implement along the way. Uh, one of the things that uh, we wanted to do within the schedule is to get a sense of what will occur during those blocks. Uh, but, you know, obviously it'll be up to the teacher to determine that and the principal to, to uh, oversee that a little bit more frequently. Um, I think it was important to, to address the, the core areas that our, our teaching staff will be addressing so that the board and the community knows that all those different topics will be covered. Um, but, you know, the, I, I do agree that community building has been very strong and that's something that will we'll definitely factor in in our talks with uh, SHTA and the principals on how to, to continue to move that forward. So thanks for that feedback. Mr. Heller, may I add on to that question? So, yes. uh, Ms. Pelosi, part of the Senate Bill 98 uh, requires us to focus on social emotional learning. So it will, build, it will be built into our schedules. We're just not sure where. Great, thank you. I just think that, I think like starting that day, making it feel as close to a school day as possible is probably desirable. You know, I, that I just, that's just a thought that I had. And I had one other clarifying question, if I may ask it at this time. Um, on the remote model um, for grades in particular, six through 12, I'm wondering, is there, I know we're probably working with the minimal instruction minutes required, is there consideration, again, because I know this is all conceptual, is, it, is there consideration that we can actually still increase those periods for those six through 12 students just with a few more minutes? Or again, is that something that we have to work out with, uh, with, the, with our teachers? Well, you know, the, the challenge is where we, we have lunch. And right now, lunch is offered very late in the day as it is. And so the goal was to try to maximize the instruction to have a, a little bit of a break for students to have a snack uh, around, uh, I believe, 10, 30, 11, somewhere in there to carry them over to lunch, which would be at 123. 
So if we increase the periods anymore, we're getting to a point where students may not eat until two o'clock and that, that didn't really seem uh, palpable. Uh, you know, I, I just want to recognize that uh, while those minutes, you know, are truncated a little bit, um, we had to fit that in to accommodate breaks and lunch as well. So, and, and just also note too that those, the times that we proposed, every, every model had a start time of 8.30 and potentially, you know, with transportation and slight adjustments in the schedule, it, it, it may be, you know, 8.25, it may be 8.35. We have to keep in mind that our, our, our transportation arrives at a certain time and we may want to stagger that internally to have uh, different grades arrive to campus at, at times so they're not all arriving at one time. So if I use the elementary as an example, third grade may arrive at 825, fourth grade may arrive at uh, you know, 835, and then fifth grade may arrive at 845, just to stagger the day to reduce the number of, of students that potentially may be around one another in an in-person model. So times and, and uh, you know, schedule format are, are somewhat flexible, uh, but we also have other little constraints that we have to keep in mind, and, um, and lunch would be one of those. Okay, thank you, Mr. Heller. Yeah. Any further questions from board members? I have two questions regarding the scheduling. Um, the first one would be how would students be broken up into group A and B? Because I would assume at the lower grade levels, it would be just by the classes. But then once you get up to the middle and high school, they're moving through X amount of classes in a day. So how would students be broken up into A and B? That's a good question. Um, that, that's going to be a logistical thing that we're going to have to work out with the counselors and the, and the administration. Once we uh, get these schedules approved, we'll, we'll continue that conversation. So uh, it won't be a student saying, uh, you know, providing, saying, well, I want to come in Thursday and Friday and not, you know, the first three days. It will be just done more on a, a scheduling basis and students will receive a schedule, a revised schedule, if, if that's what we did. Great. Thank you. And then for my second, this is more of a clarifying, I'm just looking at the grade six through 12 distance learning schedule, focusing specifically on Wednesdays, and it's a period one, two, access, period three, four, access, so on and so forth. So would those be open for students just to hop in if they have questions for their period one and two teachers, or are those a required attendance? Uh, it could be a combination of both, Joe. Uh, okay. Within that, there's, uh, you know, if you look at that uh, particular period, there's, there's 40 minutes assigned for period one and period two. So if I taught period one and two, as a teacher, I would be available the first 20 minutes and I could assign students or I could have small groups in there. And then after my 20 minutes is done with the period one, I would log out and log into the period two for the remaining 20 minutes and have that same format. So we kept it open on purpose, depending on how things go and what we see our needs. Uh, it might be scheduled and it might be required. I know that at RLS there uh, frequently required. They do schedule students in access more than the high school does. Uh, but you know, we'll leave that flexible right now just to continue to provide student support on, on that Wednesday. Great. Thank you. I have no further questions. Further questions or clarifications from board members? You know, I've got just a quick, um, just a comment, um, not necessarily a question. Um, I guess my comment would be that um, the distance learning for the um, TK5, um, specifically TK to two, I know that there's a lot of parent concern about how that's going to look and how, you know, are are those are you know how how is it going to look as far as doing that for for those for those students, especially kind of TK and and kindergarten, um, just because of going off and on, you know, into the distance learning um, teaching. I guess that's, I mean, it's not really, a, I guess it's a question, but, but I guess that there's a lot of concern about that right now. And I, and yeah. I, it's, and that's understandable. It, it's very understandable. And, um, you know, but I, I have faith in, in our, our TK through uh, T, T, or two teachers that they are thinking about the exact same thing and thinking of yeah. ways to connect with students. And I'm sure it's been on their mind all summer, uh, knowing that we're in a distance learning format now. 
while it's not ideal for them, I'm sure they're going to want in person as soon as possible. And obviously, we would be interested in, in transitioning uh, students at a TK through two level back to school as, as, as soon as we can, even in a hybrid fashion to get students in front of their teachers. Um, but, you know, that, that, is, that is a challenge, and we recognize that for sure. And if I may add on that, Mr. Heller, um, just to tap on a little further is that it would certainly be a blend of packets as well as online, uh, Jeannie, as well as we want to make sure that we really focus on the parent component this time. We felt like when we went out in March that what was lacking was really supporting the parents. So there'll be a lot more support for the parents because they are the teachers at the lower grades. Right. So it will definitely be a different model this time around. Okay, lovely. Thank you both. Thank you very much. Any other uh, questions or clarifying uh, clarifying questions from board members? I have a couple questions. The first one was uh, kind of regarding the, the the hybrid and the daily instruction. I know that the in slide 20, there the stages are, or it's based on the stages, of the county stages, but they're kind of overlapping. So they're it's two and three, and then state, the daily is two, three, and four. So, besides the county stage, what other factors would determine from going uh, from from a hybrid to uh, to the daily instruction? If, if there's any way you can clarify a little bit more of if or whether yeah. we would over or jump um, one of those stages versus the other, if you can yeah. clarify. Right, fantastic question. Uh, there is a possibility that, and, and uh, a likelihood that if determining our class size and the feasibility of returning students to campus as soon as possible, we could go from this distance learning model to full in-person instruction. Um, you know, part of that, like I said, depends on our ability to determine you know the maximum class size with with physical distancing of students and knowing how many students we'll have in the in-person model as that is our goal to work back towards uh, eventually. So we could jump from uh, distance learning right into, um, into full person with that two weeks notice that the governor's provided once we're off the watch list. Mm -hmm. And so that would be definitely something we would work towards uh, as, as, uh, as a model for our, our implementation. And then the second question was just uh, in regards to the scheduling. I know that, that there's a, um, a section from or a time slot from two to three ten, the at home study time. Yeah, so that essentially is that um, just kids doing homework, or are they check? Do they have to check in, or are they working with a teacher, or is they just basically they're they're, working? they're 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 on their own. It's dedicated time for them to complete the work within the day. So you know, one of the things that 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 might change is the concept of homework because obviously right now students are at home doing work and they they have time to do that allocated within their school day. So they may not be staying up as late or having as much homework to do in the evening. They'll, they'll have dedicated time to complete their assignments within their school day. So yeah, that's what that's allocated for. Okay, thank you. Any other further clarifying questions? I have uh, one more unless uh, Trustee Conwell would like to go next if he has questions. Trustee uh, Conwell. Go, go ahead, Lisa. I'm, uh, you know, since we all got briefed on this uh, this last week uh, prior, I'm very familiar with what's kind of going on and, and everybody's asking the questions or that I'm thinking okay. in my mind. So go ahead, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Heller, on the virtual learning program that families can enroll their students in, I know you're saying a decision in a couple of weeks would be made. Do you foresee that decision being made by the end of July to give families ample time to have discussions and determine, you know, that that's going to be the best fit for their family? I know that that's been a, a concern that's been, you know, uh, vocalized from a few families in the community. Yeah, our, you know, our, once we're concluded with the board meeting today, our staff will reconvene and begin talking about the timeline and process for that. Um, we would need to, you know, create an application and, and also you know, find a partnership with the, the program that we think's best. And so it's gonna take a little research and time just to make sure that uh, our partnership will work together. Uh, so 
I outlined the next two weeks of having that done with an eye on, as I look at my calendar to the left on July 31st, which is Friday, having, if nothing else, information to families. Um, and we want to provide uh, additional information in a, in a Zoom opportunity or some sort of way to have a Q&A with parents to, uh, you know, listen to some concerns and feedback, but also describe what we're looking at in a, in a virtual program as well for their children. Thank you very much. Any other questions? So um, I have a couple questions uh, myself, um, and I believe I know the answers to these. I just want to be sure. Um, this is again with uh, respect to the virtual academy. That is the full year of uh, of um, online learning, um, remote learning. Um, I just want to uh, understand that it is correct that the district will be covering all the cost of materials associated with the program, that the school will be still providing lunches uh, and school meals to those children that need them, and then also will they be providing the personal devices and Wi-Fi hotspots to those families? May I answer this Hello, question? You're on mute. Mr. Heller, you're on mute. You're still on mute. Uh, Mary, did you want to answer? Go ahead. Would you like me to sure. jump in? Okay. Sure. Um, so as, as Mr. Heller was stating, we're looking at a variety of options. If we uh, select the uh, district pay option, then yes, we would provide the uh, devices, the electronic devices. Attendance would be integrated within our system, and we would certainly make sure that our students were fed. Thank you. And um, of course, those parents that are interested in this, uh, in this option, they'll be receiving a lot more information in the coming weeks, correct? Correct. That correct. is correct because their school year, if we were going that route, uh, Maria Haug, is that they would be starting at uh, roughly the third week in August, so we would have to get things determined definitely by the end of July. Thank you. Any further questions or clarifying uh, comments for, from board members? Okay, uh, district staff, I think we're ready to move on. All right, so now um, we're bringing uh, Andy Stubbs, our chief business official to the uh, microphone. Thank you, and uh, can you hear me okay? Okay, uh, the next several slides that we'll look at talk about all the non-instructional elements of the school district whereby we're supporting the reopening plans. Uh, and that has to do with facilities, food services, and transportation, and students' support. And advance the slide, please. So this slide here is a snapshot out of the CDC guidelines. And Mary Lou and Chris talked already about how we are all looking at all the various official guidelines to identify uh, all the necessary steps that we need to take to reopen and to help to ensure that students are safe. And so you can see, for example, that middle column, uh, it talks about guidance related to hygiene and cleaning and disinfecting. And so uh, the operations team has been looking at all those guidelines and elements to prepare for the reopening of the school year. And next slide. With regard to custodial and facilities in particular, uh, our team has, uh, again, been reviewing all the recommended guidelines about how to clean and sanitize and disinfect areas. Uh, and so we are prepared to modify our cleaning schedules to ensure that we're able to stay on top of that, particularly in those high touch areas and high, um, highly visited areas of bathrooms and classrooms and offices. We have ordered a large stock of um, chemicals and cleaning products that meet the Environmental Protection Act standards. We've ordered a lot of equipment, for example, the electric static sprayers, 
uh, to ensure that we have everything that we need to start off the school year. And next slide. We have visited the classrooms and lay, done a variety of different furniture layouts so that we can affect the greatest physical distance that we can between students and between students and staff. We've looked at different types of furniture placements. We've also uh, thought about utilizing outdoor spaces when we can. And, uh, and so we purchased a variety of equipment to support the modifications that we're going to need to make. We purchased uh, almost a thousand plexiglass barriers for students and staff. We've purchased a large stock of physical distancing reminders such as wall signs and floor stickers. Uh, each school site will have eight to 12 hand sanitizing stations and at least four uh, additional hand washing stations. Um, and then with regard to our HVAC systems, we have changed to a much higher grade uh, air filter for every space that can reduce the presence of virus by approximately 75 to 80%. We've also purchased some HEPA, uh, what are called air scrubbers, which can further reduce the presence of virus, uh, both in larger areas and small office spaces. So we're doing a lot to ensure that the physical um, uh, buildings and grounds are all ready for students and staff to return. And this slide here lists all of the different um, personal protective equipment, uh, or pardon me, the, the, um, it reiterates the uh, equipment and supplies and materials that we purchased that we've talked about already. So the hand sanitizing stations, for example, uh, the conversion sinks, which help to turn drinking fountains into sinks, and we are researching that right now. And we have a large stock of the hand soap, the hand sanitizer, wipes, paper towels, tissues, all those things. And we're continuously monitoring what we have in stock and then preparing to order more as needed. Here we talk about the personal protective equipment. And so we have uh, prepared an order and expect to receive thousands of the disposable masks to start off the school year when we are ready to go back to in-person learning. Um, we will have over 5,500 cloth masks. We have plastic shields, both with and without drapes for staff. We have thousands of disposable gloves. We have medical grade masks and gowns for staff that may be working with sick students. We have purchased uh, no-touch thermometers. We'll have one for every classroom in main office. And we will have uh, at least 300 oral thermometers that are available upon parent request so that they can take those home and do their um, health screenings at home. And so the idea here is that we recognizing that uh, when we are allowed to go back to school, either with a hybrid or a full day model, we will want to have all this equipment in place and ready to go for everybody. And we have lots of it in stock already with more to come. And we've talked about most of these elements already uh, during the presentation, the idea of, uh, of families doing health screenings at home and staff also doing some health monitoring. Uh, and so the guidelines include temperature checks um, and checking symptoms. Um, and we'll be working very closely with the instructional administrative staff to uh, promote the safe movement of students throughout the campuses, uh, again, utilizing those um, the physical distancing signs and stickers. And then we are evaluating our transportation routes to see how we can uh, best continue to serve students. Um, and the routes will be based on the current bus stops that we have, uh, but we'll have to make some time adjustments as Mr. Heller was describing. Uh, and then we're working with the school principals to give them some additional budget to purchase uh, instructional materials and supplies that, he, that they might need so that students have when they return uh, their own um, box or what have you, pencils and so forth. Uh, and then continuing to develop our plans for schedules around facility sanitization and campus cleaning. With regard to food services, all of the federal and state waivers that have allowed us to serve meals in a very flexible way have been extended through the end of the next school year. 
And so we will continue um, during the distance learning uh, time when we reopen the school year, we'll continue the use of prepackaged meal kits to ensure that we can get all students a meal. Uh, and the, um, the pickup time will be determined based on the schedule. Um, and then those will be five day meal kits again, breakfast and lunch. Once we're able to resume in-person learning, then we will be adjusting uh, menus again to accommodate schedules. We may have to continue the use of prepackaged meals if needed, and we will certainly have those available for students who are participating in the virtual learning program. And our food services staff has already been trained in safe and hygienic preparation and service, and we will continue to um, provide them with training. We have also applied for and been approved for a universal breakfast program for all. And so that will ensure that our students have, uh, have a healthy snack, breakfast snack in the morning, in addition to the lunch that will be provided later in the day. We've talked about transportation already. We will be working very closely with instructional administrative staff to adjust our routes uh, to be able to get students uh, to school on time when we're able to resume in-person learning. Um, as the board knows, we are contracting with Michael's Transportation for Drivers this year. We've leased buses and we are moving forward in all those efforts to ensure that transportation is up and ready to go for the 2021 school year um, as soon as we're able to bring students back. And then when we are able to bring students back and they're riding the buses again, Drivers and students will be required to wear masks. Drivers will carry extras in case a student doesn't bring one. Um, we will do physical distancing when, when possible, which may be uh, possible with the hybrid model, um, but we will, we will ensure also space between the students and the driver. We will look at some uh, safe loading practices, for example, loading the rear of the bus first to minimize student contact. And the bus drivers themselves will be helping with bus disinfection daily. They'll have uh, one of our electrostatic sprayers and they'll be able to uh, spray down the buses after use and um, wipe uh, frequently touched surfaces and so forth. And then we are contracting with a company to come and do monthly bus cleaning and then also professional grade disinfecting. Uh, technology support will be so essential for the distance learning component of, of 2020-21. We are planning a student device collection during the week of July 27th through the 31st, and we've been letting parents know about that because we need to get the devices back for um, uh, at least seven days so that we can clean and disinfect them and, and uh, do the re-imaging and so forth that we need to do the, with those. They will then be redeployed to students prior to the start of school. Uh, and then when the school year resumes, we will ensure that our IT staff is providing uh, that high quality daily student and staff support that they were able to provide during the spring. Uh, we'll reevaluate our wireless hotspots and ensure that we've got all of those uh, available for students who need them. And we're looking into additional ways to boost remote internet access for students. And we've already purchased um, student peripherals uh, that principals have requested, headphones for students in grades TK through eight, um, the computer mice for students in the elementary and middle school, um, and then additionally, some other tools that teachers and students have requested. With regard to support services, we've talked a little bit about the screening requirements and so, uh, we're going to be providing parents with extensive education and support in terms of doing those passive screening at home when students are able to return to school. Um, and uh, as we mentioned, we'll be providing parents with oral thermometers upon request to support their efforts at home. And then uh, staff will be monitoring students for symptoms of illness and we'll have uh, the no touch thermometers available all throughout the district. We've also talked a little bit already about mental health, and so we will continue, of course, to have our counselors and our psychologists providing uh, support services for students. There are a variety of um, resources available 
outside of the district through the Up Valley Family Center and other partners, and we will continue to promote all of those resources on our district website. We have also increased our contract with the Up Valley Family Center. We'll be providing more student hours in 2021. And next slide. Mr. Heller. Okay. Yep, the next slide's me. Um, you know, the, I just wanna take an opportunity to remind the board and our community that, you know, it's important to recognize that our schools and school district is a place of employment. And as we continue to monitor state and local updates, we'll continue to adjust our plans, but, you know, we are acquiring personal protective equipment uh, for our staff to ensure that they're conducting school in the safest manner as possible. But we do have an obligation to our employees to ensure safe working conditions. And uh, so under that, we, we're obligated to work with our employees to identify underlying health or age concerns that may impact uh, their status in starting the school year. And, and we've begun that process with our, our bargaining groups already. So we'll continue those conversations, but I just wanna make sure that uh, you know, it is known that we, we have employees that do have underlying health conditions or age concerns in, in you know, exposing themselves at the workplace and, and we're working on that process as well. So uh, from a human uh, resources angle, uh, we, we, again, I want to reiterate that we, we will open school when it is safe for our employees and our students. Thank you, Chris, Mary, and Andy. Uh, in closing, um, this was a lot of information. And as Chris just mentioned, health and safety is a primary concern. We as a district are committed to, in, committed to ensuring student access for all of our students. We want every child to be educated. We'll continue to monitor and evaluate the risk weekly in alignment with the local and state orders. And this is going to be a challenging year. I believe Chris mentioned that earlier in the presentation. It's going to be one of the most challenging years for our students, our parents, our board members, our teachers, and all of our employees. We must be flexible, we must be kind, and we must approach all of our work with positive intent. And as a reminder, our goal is to provide an in-person five-day-a-week schedule for all of our students as quickly as we are able to knowing that we must be in alignment with state and local orders and um, in alignment with our, our employees. And right now, we will start the school year with a robust distance, distance learning for our students who want to join us in person as quickly as possible. And we will have a virtual learning program for students who choose remote learning for the entire school year. When it's permitted, we will move into phase two with an in-person, hybrid if we have to, or five full day, and phase three in person, five full day as well. Remind, remembering that the virtual learning program will be available through the entire school year. So our next steps, there'll be lots more parent communication via email, via text, parent information sessions. There'll be, uh, our district website will continue to be updated. Mention the information meetings. We'll be asking you to um, enroll and select those two options, the robust distance learning for those who are joining us in person, and then also the virtual learning program for those who are choosing remote learning for the entire school year. And at this time, board members, the staff recommendation is to approve the TK learning mod models as we presented you today as, as a concept knowing that those times may need to be varied slightly. Subject matter may move from one hour to another. Basically, we're looking at those um, conceptual models and we're recommending approval. And we are in open for um, questions and comments at this time. Thank you to all of our administration that has prepared this, uh, this presentation this morning for the board and for the entire community. I would like to um, speak now as to um, public comment. I know that there are a lot of uh, community members. This is probably the very first uh, school board meeting you've ever seen. Or it might be the first one you've ever attended. Uh, the Brown Act restricts the board from considering any item that did not appear on this posted agenda. 
So now, um, shortly, members of this public will be entitled to speak on any item that is on the agenda. Um, each person is entitled to speak on it only once at this meeting. The right to speak at the appropriate time waives any further right to address the board on that item in this meeting. Participation in a debate on the item before the board is limited to the members of the board. It is not, uh, it is not the public that is engaged in the debate that the board is, is engaged in. Although board members may ask members of the public for additional information if they so desire. Testimony is not protected from damage claims or libel. Public charges or allegations may result in legal action being brought by those individuals. Please keep your comments concise, brief, and limited to three minutes. That is all um, outlined in our instructions for public comment but I did wanna repeat it for everyone. So again, I would like to remind everyone that public comment is limited to this agenda item. The agenda item is the SHUSD reopening plan as it was presented. Again, any public comment that does not address the reopening plan will not be addressed by the board. So please, during public comment, refrain from any comments do not, that do not pertain to our plan. Now, I would like to um, ask Ms. Madrigal. She will be um, monitoring the public comment. We did receive public comment by email prior to the meeting, and that is all part of our agenda. I encourage everyone who is watching this meeting to read that public comment for themselves. All board members have already read and had access to that public comment. So, uh, Ms. Madrigal, I would like to um, uh, have you monitor now the, uh, the public comment portion of our meeting. Yes, the first attendee is David. David, I am unmuting you and you are now allowed to talk. David, are you there? Maybe is we this can... David, there you go. Is this David, I have no comments. Thank you, David. Thank you for attending the meeting. Uh, Ms. Madrigal, um, maybe I should further explain. If you have public comment, please click on the hand portion of the Zoom meeting. Amy C., you are now allowed to speak. Um, hi, can everyone, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, um, I have a quick question. So, um, and again, thank you for your time. And um, this is a very, um, it's a great presentation. It's clear. Um, so my question is, uh, is, is, it seems like we have to pick um, whether we want to do a full year virtual learning or, um, you know, the distant learning. Is that is that correct? That's my assumption that in the next uh, few couple weeks, a uh, survey will get sent out when we have to pick, pick either or. And my question is, if we choose to pick in person, I know right now we're at phase one, so it's still distant. Um, but as we enter phase two, um, do we still have, um, if for whatever reason, right, we don't feel comfortable sending our kids back to school, can we continue the distance learning at home or we have no option but to send them back? A very good question. Um, we will continue with the public comment, Ms. Chang, and then that question will be answered at the end of public comment. Uh, administrators, can we make a note of that question? So, um, Ms. Madrigal, on to the next public comment. Yes, the next public comment participant would be Angela Z. Angela, I'm going to unmute your microphone now. Good morning. Thank you very much. Um, I'm wondering if the school board 
to please uh, take a very close look at the California Department of Public. A specific provision in there on the very first page indicates that it's possible school district to apply for a waiver through the California Department of Public Health for the requirement for all distance learning, even during the uh, early phases. I, I'm not clear on exactly what that process entails, but I would like to make sure and point this out to the uh, school district to make sure to look into that as an option. Um, and also please to consider the uh, opportunities that we have for outdoor learning, which would really mitigate most of the concerns surrounding the transmission of COVID and uh, all the sanitation requirements are a completely different picture. We do have a lot of outdoor space available um, that would make it a lot more feasible for students to come and have in-person learning. Thank you, Angela, Angela Z. Uh, Ms. Madrigal, are there other public comments or questions? Yes, there are five more public comments. Okay, thank you. Thank you, community. Uh, Ms. Madrigal will call you as, as you uh, raised your hand. Christina D., I am going to unmute you and you are now allowed to talk. Uh, yes, hi. I had actually mine are all questions and I have five questions. I don't know if I should stop at each or just present the questions and then you all would respond afterwards. That's fine. Okay. Um, so the first question I had is relative to the mandate um, from Governor Newsom about the 100% distance learning. Um, I'm just wondering if um, leading up to the point from now until uh, the school year starts, if we Napa County is removed from the list, will we then start with one of the models, the hybrid or the in-person? Um, is that, is 14 days, how long does it take to enact and begin one of the other models, in-person models? Okay, and next question? Uh, the next question is, at the point that um, we are going, uh, when we're in the 100% distance learning, it's unclear in the presentation how many hours a day are going to be dedicated to live virtual instruction versus how many hours a day or week the parents are expected to administer the curriculum. And then should I proceed to the next question? Yes. Okay. Um, and then assuming that um, as we move into phase two that um, parents are going to be administering portions of the program, are we going to be part of that voting process and what will that look like? Is it going to be in survey form and kind of what percentage are the parents' voice going into that decision? And then the, uh, the fourth question is, in reopening of schools, um, as these decisions are made, it sounds like um, you all have mentioned that they're conceptual at this point. Are, um, is feedback from parents going to factor into actually going from concept to uh, rolling those out. Right now it seems like on that transition team there's just been one parent representative for each of the schools which doesn't seem adequate to really get a good representation of what parents are thinking and would there be more ways for parents to participate and have a voice in those discussions and decisions. And then the last question um, and I don't know if it's relevant here or not but in the um, point where in, in this 100% um, distance learning phase, is the Boys and Girls Club going to be activated or no, or is that not something that you all um, would govern? And that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Dreyer. Uh, Ms. Madrigal, other questions and comments? Yes, Andrea A, I'm going to unmute you now. Andrea? So maybe we can come back to Andrea. Yes. The next participant is Bianca C. Go ahead. Bianca? Um, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. yes, go ahead, Ms. Collip. Um, so my question is in regards to the learning portion from home and the instructional portion. Last year, um, 
there was no instructional done at the middle school level. It was all Excel spreadsheets, click on the link, and all of my child's teachers informed me they would not be doing any instructional teaching. So will they actually be doing instructional teaching during this time at the middle school level? Okay, and do you have any further questions, Ms. Call? That's it. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Madrigal, are there further, is there further public comment? Yeah. Yes, I have three additional comments. Go uh, ahead. The next caller is Carl T. Carl, I'm going to unmute you now. Carl, can you please unmute your microphone? There you are. Go ahead. Hello? You have me now? Yes, go ahead, Carl. I'm sorry. Uh, thank okay. you, board, and thank you, administration. I appreciate all the work that you put in. I am a high school teacher, and on a normal situation, we have, or a normal school day, we have block periods on Wednesday and Thursday to conduct labs. Will this type of a schedule be considered in the future where we'll have these extended periods to do labs? And that was my quick question. I will thank you. Thank you, Mr. Turner, and thank you for all you do for our students. Andrea, can you uh, provide public comment now? Yes, can you hear us? Yes, perfect. Hi, this is William Weiner, Andrew's husband. We had a question about um, when children get assigned teachers, what their cohort's going to be, and that's in relation to, since we are doing online learning, it would be nice to know what our daughter's classmates are going to be so we can institute some sort of like, you know, group study or, or study groups um, for our children. So we we're wondering when we would get the class list and hopefully earlier than we normally do. Thank you. Do you have any further comments or questions? No, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Madrigal, any Jean, further? Yes, Jean Marie, I'm going to unmute you now. Oh, you're thank unmuted, you. go ahead. <laughs> thank you. Uh, first of all, again, board, thank you. Uh, I'm sure this challenging time is not easy for anyone. I appreciate all of your efforts. Um, my question is, in being a baseball fan these days and seeing how baseball is handling uh, playing a game in front of an empty uh, sports stadium, has there been any top talk of doing a live stream where the teachers would actually be in the classroom and the students would log on at their normal time when they would have class uh, and doing something similar to that so they aren't losing, I, I'm thinking most especially in high school, losing their time, face time with teachers and still feeling like they were in class. So that was my question. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeannie. Mm -hmm. uh, Erica, there's one more question or two. Yes, I am going to um, unmute uh, Amelie. Yes. Go ahead, Amelie. Hi, my name is Amelie Svein, and my son is in St. Helena Primary School going into grade two. And I actually just had a question about my daughter. Um, we had applied for her to also join St. Helena Primary School through the DOC system. And we, of course, want both of them to be in the same school. And we were wondering what that would look like for her as we haven't gotten an acceptance for her and she'd be going into kindergarten.
just want to make sure you got that. Maria, you're on mute. I apologize. I was on mute. Um, okay. I, I just did thank you, Ms. Svein, for, um, for your feedback and your question. Um, it will be answered by our district staff. Uh, Erica, are there any further, is there any further public comment at the, at right now? Yes, I would like to uh, provide, pub provide the opportunity for public comment to Coco L. Go ahead, Coco. Hi, everyone. Um, I have a comment and a question. Um, my comment is that I just want to also um, encourage as much as possible opportunities for parents to discuss um, specifically with each school site what the curriculum will be and how the principals and teachers are envisioning each grade. Uh, to my knowledge, there hasn't been anything that really focuses on each school site and what the curriculum is. And I know that we all have a lot of questions about what and how are our children gonna be learning? And what kind of support will each grade uh, cohort, cohort really need from parents? Um, and then my question is actually about for those families uh, who feel that it's better for them to commit to a full year of distance learning, is there a time frame in which we will know more about what that option is, who the contractor is, all of that that's going on, whether or not there will be classes, because for our family personally, and I would imagine others, as we try and navigate these decisions, you know, what that option would look like becomes very important. Thank you, Coco. Thank you. And thank you as well for serving as a, as a PTG uh, representative. Um, Erica, further uh, public comments? Yes, I have Derek. Go ahead, Derek. Hi, this is Derek. Hopefully you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, good morning, board members. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to share our concerns with you today regarding the agenda item 4A. I uh, just want to kind of reiterate the letter that we we sent over that you know our child's entering St. Helena High School this fall and based on the school's performance we observed last trimester at the RLS we're genuinely concerned with the lack of teaching that occurred. Uh, we asked that if the student um, do not return to school this fall which sounds like is the case um, that the school district staff make some major improvements to the way that they administer remote learning and engage students in the education. We believe good leadership starts from the top and there are difficult decisions that need to be made to hold staff accountable. After writing the superintendent in late March about our concerns the teacher, that the teachers were not teaching, the superintendent referred us to the principal of RLS and assured us that the teaching would improve after spring break and there would be more online educating. To our dismay, nothing changed. No additional teaching was done online or assigned by email. Our son did all the work assigned in an hour or less each day, and only one teacher was providing weekly virtual class sessions. This is completely unacceptable. There's no reason today with the technological resources we have available for this school district that teachers should be failing at any of this. Now that Governor Newsom has given money for all teachers and students to have internet, that can no longer be an excuse for not providing virtual sessions. We are in extraordinary times that require extraordinary measures and solution-oriented leadership. Even if schools are not considered an essential service, teachers educating and engaging our children is. If teachers are not doing their job, they should not be receiving a paycheck. Students are getting depressed and unable to socially interact or engage with their teachers and friends, which is essential at this age. The district could be liable if remote learning is inadequate like it was this last spring. We really hope you, as a board member, understand the moral obligation you have with this decision. There needs to be a drastic improvement in remote learning. We are begging you to please make sure the teachers actually put in the same hours 
they normally would have if the students were on site and have some sort of accountability plan in place to ensure there's quality teaching happening. So thank you for hearing me today. Thank you, Derek. Thank you. And I believe we also received your um, presentation by mail as well. It's located in our agenda. Uh, Erica, are there any other, is there any other public comment at this time? There are no other attendees who indicated public comment. So I would like to thank all the parents, the community members, and the teacher who provided public comment at this meeting. We are really grateful for your interest, your concern, and your understanding at this time. In the past few weeks, we've done our best to respond to your questions. We will continue to work with you and respond to your questions as they arise, and there are going to be lots more questions that do arise. So the administration, uh, the board, and the staff is always going to be ready to listen to your concerns. I want everyone to know that. Everyone has a different approach to this, uh, to our current situation. They have different perspectives. They have different situations in their families. And I want everyone to know that as a board, we have 14 children. 14 children that have either gone through this school system or are currently enrolled in the school system. We are all parents. So we do understand how difficult it is. We do understand the disappointment of, of a child who, whose senior year did not end up the way it was supposed to end up. We understand how difficult it is when you have multiple small children in the home. So I want everyone to understand that the board is going to be working with you as parents and with the administration as, as educators and with our teachers. We have to do this together as a team. And I really thank you for all of your input. I wanna thank everyone who has attended this board, uh, this board meeting virtually. And I also wanna thank everyone who's going to watch it at a later time once it's posted to our YouTube channel. So, Right now, um, I would like to, uh, I would like to, oh, oops, sorry. I would like to open the board meeting to deliberation by the board members um, in this virtual meeting. Um, I would like first for our administrative staff to uh, address the questions that were raised during public comment. Um, I have made notes, and I'm sure other board members have as well. Uh, we would like to um, clarify all the concerns that were raised, and um, the administration can decide who is best uh, able to answer the questions that were raised. You can ask me if there are any questions as to um, what, what needs to be addressed. Thank you, President Haug. Uh, Mr. Heller, um, uh, Ms. Allen, I'll be calling on you to answer a few of these questions. Uh, the first question that I heard Mr. Heller was, in the event that a parent chooses the remote with the intent to uh, come to us in person and they change their mind, what can they do? Can they stay remote for the full year? Yeah, at that point, uh, if a parent elects to continue with the remote, say in October when we return to school as a, as a date, for example, uh, at that point, they would probably need to enroll in that remote program that we have with the district returning uh, in a hybrid or an in-person fashion. If a parent elects to stay remote, then they would choose the virtual academy for a program. Thank you, Mr. Heller. The second question was about the um, governor's mandate and the 14 days. And my understanding is that um, we are on the monitoring system. Uh, we are a monitored county um, as long as we have continued cases. And we need to have um, no increase in cases for 14 days before we come off of the monitoring list. And if you go to the Napa County Public Health website and you look at the dashboard, um, the, the modeling that has been conducted indicates that currently we are doubling our cases every 17 days in the Napa County. So unfortunately, Dr. Relucio, our public health um, officer, is um, 
predicting that our cases will be at a high right at the point where school is supposed to start. And so um, I, I don't foresee us going, getting out of the monitoring at the uh, start of the school year. We will monitor that very closely though. Uh, and that website, the Napa County Public Health website and the dashboard is very helpful in um, giving you information about the county specifically. Mr. Heller, this one is coming to you. The question was, how many hours will students actually be interacting with their teachers in the remote um, model, in the distance learning model? Uh, I, I don't recall hearing what grade levels those were, but those were outlined in the particular schedules. If, if you're in the secondary level and it says periods, you would be with your teacher during those Zoom periods. Uh, so teachers would be taking attendance and students would be accountable to showing up for all their periods. Uh, and in the TK5 models, uh, there's the full class instruction and then there's also smaller group instruction. Uh, sometimes students will not always be in that small group instruction. It was broken up by groups A, B, and C. And teachers will work with parents directly to inform uh, them when the students should attend. And so just to clarify, Mr. Heller, the schedules that you shared earlier and that can be found in the PowerPoint are the student schedules where they are actually, if it says a period, they are actually in a Zoom meeting with their teacher. That is correct. Thank you. The next one is for you as well because you have been um, conducting all of our surveys. It, when and if we are able to move into a hybrid or in-person, um, what parent voice will occur? Will there be more surveys? Will there be principals working with, with parents? How will the parent voice be involved? So uh, as we return to school and open, reopen our school campuses and our offices with uh, some staff in August and the principals return to the campus, a lot of the, the uh, information collecting and gathering will be conducted by site through the principals. Uh, the district's collection of information was really to develop these three models in alignment with our uh, safety measures that we've created. Uh, much of the feedback uh, by grade level will be done through the principals so they can take that input and, you know, modify and, you know, tweak their schedules in a, in a way that are more appropriate for their grade sites and grade levels. Um, as far as voting goes, uh, you know, the, the schedules that we've created are negotiated items with bargaining units. Uh, so there's not a true mechanism to vote on that. Uh, but the input prior to uh, school starting is, is critical uh, for, from a parent voice. So uh, they can write their principals an email. Um, they can write me an email. Uh, so we can take that into consideration. Thank you. And then the next question was basically the same question around feedback. So I'll move on to the following question, which was about the Boys and Girls Club. One of our members of the community asked um, what, what's happening with the Boys and Girls Club. We have a really great relationship um, with the Boys and Girls Club, and we have been in contact with them. I don't know if you are aware, they are currently open and can serve up to 50 students a day and are hovering somewhere around uh, the high teens and low 20s on a daily basis. Uh, we have a, another meeting with them this week, and so we'll continue to work with them to determine what services they can provide for our community. Um, Mr. Heller, the next one is for you as well, having to do with concerns around uh, distance learning in uh, the fall. Maybe you can talk about, generally speaking, the accountability um, with regards to uh, student attendance again, and then also teachers and uh, the Zoom meetings that they'll be having. Sure. Uh, as mentioned earlier in the presentation, when we went into our model in the March, you know, it was a kind of a scramble to to. Uh, have materials and devices and hotspots to all students. And, you know, our, we were in a pandemic and our teachers uh, uh, also have families. And, and so we created a schedule that allowed education to continue. But, you know, as we reflect on it, was it perfect? No. Did we have the model that we have in place now? Uh, no, not at that time. Did we have the training for our teachers that we've provided in late June and having an opportunity for them to debrief, we didn't have that either. So I anticipate with you know, the, the schedules that we've created for students, especially at the secondary level where you know, they have scheduled periods and uh, Zoom meetings and opportunities for access to their teachers that uh, the new distance learning model that we've created for the fall will look 
entirely different and, and I'm looking forward to seeing it in action. And Dr. Then, Wilson, may I just tap on to that? Yes. Just briefly, I just wanted to state that the uh, California Department of Education will be having instructional guidelines related to distance learning coming out either at the end of this week or the beginning of next week. Thank you, Mary. And then uh, Mr. Heller, uh, one of our teachers at the high school asked about lab classes and how will we handle uh, any of the, the teaching opportunities where it's typically in a lab format? That's, um, that's gonna be a challenge. Um, you know, the, the lab pieces are, I, I actually feel like it's more appropriate to kind of shift the question back to the teacher and think of how, how are you going to be creative and, and you know, designing labs that students can conduct remotely. Um, you know, while we're, we're in this distance learning model. So it's going to take some creativity and it's going to take some redesign of, of activities that have been done in the past. But, um, you know, as far as the time goes, uh, the, the time blocks are set up the way that they are right now, as we talked about with some of the constraints that we have uh, via transportation, breaks, and lunch. Uh, so I'm not sure if, I, I don't believe we're going to be able to make a larger block um, at this time of, of distance learning. So uh, I think that's just going to be up to departments and individual teachers to think about their curriculum of how they can deliver it in this distance learning model in a different manner. And when we're in person, would there be an opportunity for labs? When we're in person, yes. Yes, of course. Okay, thank you. But, you know, I, I say yes, of course, but you know, there's the handling of materials and things like that that we're going to have to review by uh, particular classes. So it, it may look a little different as as much of this school year will, as a lot of things are gonna look different. Thank you. And then um, Mary and or Chris, uh, teacher assignments with regards to um, all, all grades, when will those occur? Well, you know, I mean, at this point, we're, we're, we're trying to get the models uh, approved today so we can continue next steps. Um, you know, obviously the principals will continue that work we're, I can't put a deadline or a date on it. I can't assure parents that it will be done any earlier than it is uh, normally. So that'll be continued work and communicated through uh, parents with, 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 or excuse me, through administration with parents. Um, you know, know that we're doing the best that we can to get that information out to you as soon as possible. And then I believe we've already talked about this one to confirm. This was a, a, a suggestion that the teachers actually live stream their teaching via Zoom. Um, and to confirm that is the intent that the teachers will be connecting with their students based on the schedules um, in concept that you um, shared earlier. If I understand that question correctly, yes, that they're, they're doing distance learning. I think it was, I might have understood it as a hybrid model that um, if while students are in a class that a teacher is conducting a Zoom class concurrently. Um, and if that's the case, we, we need to continue to have further discussions about that because that does pose challenges for a teacher to monitor essentially two classrooms at one time. So um, I just want to make sure that I'm answering the intent of that. If it's distance learning, they will be conducting Zoom classes or Google Hangout. Uh, but if it's in a hybrid model, uh, that's, that needs to be explored a little bit further. Okay, thank you. The next question was around um, district of choice and whether or not a younger child um, will be admitted. Uh, we are, um, we have gone through the process of uh, acknowledging and looking at our enrollment for the new school year. And at this time have invited students um, to participate and join our school district based on uh, the uh, enrollment uh, cap and whether or not we have room in that particular grade. If you've not received that um, notification, then that means that that grade at this time is at cap and there is not room for additional students. Uh, the next question was about remote learning and the time frame. And I, my, my notes are a little bit weak. So if somebody, I know this one would go to you, Mr. Heller. So if you have the rest of that question, it would be helpful. I think it was just about the work communicating the curriculum with um, teachers and the principal concurrently with parents. And I think, you know, to answer that question, that's going to just take some time with teachers reconvening and, and getting an opportunity to, uh, you know, assess their curriculum and the manner that they're going to deliver uh, instruction via distance learning. So uh, the, the work with 
that will be done by department and grade level and consultation with the principal. So yes, and actually, this was that was Coco L's question that I I skipped over. Uh, Mary, can you talk about curriculum and the standards based curriculum that will be taught? You're on mute, Mary. Thank you. Um, every year we're required to follow the state standards per grade level as far as math, science, history, all of our core classes as well as other classes. And those, those standards will still be addressed in the distance learning model. So there's not, we're, we might need to cut back somewhat because we're looking at mastery of what do they absolutely need to learn before they move out of that grade level. Uh, but we're waiting for some additional guidance from the state. But at this point, we're planning to address the state standards in our distance learning. Thank you, Mary. And then Chris, um, the, the final uh, letter that was read was around the concern uh, of lack of teaching. And if you could um, just one more time summarize, um, you know, the learnings from the past and how we are moving forward with regards to um, academics and our students in a distance learning model. I think succinctly, I've, I've said it several times in the presentation, it's just that uh, I, I, I don't feel that uh, the models that we've created, uh, that we've worked with SHTA on, are, are going to be anything less than successful this fall. Um, I know that in March of last year, with all the unknowns that we have and, and the considerations that we had to continue conducting school in the middle of a pandemic, our, our teachers did, did an admirable job of balancing things and, and providing uh, opportunities for students to continue their learning, not knowing what kind of situation every family was in. Not every family uh, was able to provide food and shelter and, and have kind of a normal uh, experience during that time. We had a lot of families that were in crisis. We had a lot of families that were moving out of the area. So. I, I think in balancing the, the pandemic that we were in and the uh, obligation we had to continue instruction overall, I think we did a good job. Um, a good is not good enough. We always want to have great. And so I think with the work that we've done, like I said, in, in June and having teachers have an opportunity to continue to discuss and uh, refine their practice, I, I think we're moving towards great. And, and I'm you know, anticipating that when we start school on August 17th. Thank you, Mr. Heller. As I look at my notes, I, I wanted to go back. I, I did miss um, uh, some comments with regards to waivers with public health department. Uh, I know uh, Mary Allen is in line with the state um, California Department of Education and we'll be monitoring that very closely. And yes, you are absolutely right. We do have lots of outdoor space um, and we will use outdoor space when we are able to. Um, we actually have uh, tents at both the primary and the elementary school that are quite large and would even um, allow for shade as well. President Haug, I believe that um, is the, uh, the summation of the questions and or comments that were shared. And I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you for administration for all of your answers. And again, uh, thank you to um, to the uh, parent comments that we receive and, and teacher comments that we receive. So um, because this is the first uh, fully virtual board meeting um, for our members, um, I would like to uh, go through all of our board members alphabetically with their feedback on and further questions and concerns as to uh, the reopening plan right now. And if I go through everything alphabetically, Joe, Joe Brody, you would be first. But since you are our student board uh, representative, I will let you choose to either um, make your comments first or last. And then once all of us have had one chance to make comments, then we will have regular deliberation uh, where we can interact. Okay, Joe, how do you feel? Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to go last. That's fine, I completely understand. Um, Great, Jeff, um, I'd like to, I like your feedback first, and then we will, um, we will all have a turn at feedback, and then we will all um, open the floor to uh, regular discussion. Uh, first of all, I have to commend uh, 
our staff and administration especially, uh, this has been no summer for them. It has uh, been a constant roller coaster ride as to what our health situation is going to be, what uh, we plan it is, and I truly appreciate everything uh, from the superintendent leading the charge to getting us to where we are today. Uh, I think we are significantly better off. Um, I do agree that last year there was a lot of, in March that is, there was a lot of things that came up that uh, was a lot of uncertainty. I think we are now much more prepared where as, as much as we can be about the future of how we're gonna do this. Now, the implementation is gonna be the next challenge, but I really like the plan uh, in concept. I'm very, very pleased to hear that the uh, teachers will be in there um, in a Zoom class during that period of time. So it'll, as best we can do, represent uh, online uh, teaching at school <laughs> at home. And so uh, I'm very excited about uh, where we are right now and uh, look forward to we will certainly have many, many uh, rises and falls for sure, but I think uh, right now where we are, where we stand, is a very good place, and that's that's my comments. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeannie. I would like to hear your comments next. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to actually also thank um, all of our our administration and our staff. Um, I also want to thank the parents for in the community for all of the the time that they've taken and their thoughtful questions and their um, thoughtful input. Um, there is there is a lot. There's no doubt about it. And there's uh, I don't think that any of us ever thought that we would have to experience something like this. Um, I'm uh, like Jeff. I'm 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 pleased with the plan. I I I know that it's going to be. Um, difficult for parents though, as far as just timing, you know, and I'm talking about the, the distance learning one at this point. Um, but, I, but I really feel confident that um, uh, with the teachers being in the classroom, with the schedule that's been put in place, and with just, um, just knowing that we can do this, um, I, I, I feel confident in that. Um, it is my hope, and I'm, I'm sure it's the hope of everyone that's here on this, on this Zoom meeting, that we do move into in person um, rather quickly, if we if we can, it would be it would be wonderful if we can do that. Um, so that would be one of my questions: is is this the transition from um, the distance learning into the hybrid or to um, uh, in in person? If the transition is would be pretty, I'm not going to say easy, but it would would it be would, would the transition be able to happen in like in a week or two weeks? So that would be my first question. Um, um, I also, I'm, um, I'm concerned as all of us are about any kind of possible learning loss from last year. Um, and um, having the, having a increase of support for all of our students. Um, I know that that's tricky just because of the number of staff members that we have and just the way that this, that how remote is going to, the remote learning, distance lo learning um, looks. Uh, but that's something I would like to keep considering as a board and a, as a district as to how we can support our, um, our students that, the, that need students. Um, uh, one of the thoughts that I had about um, student assessments was, I, I know at the beginning of each year, I know that our um, our teachers routinely do a, um, a quick assessment on our students to see where they're at when they're when they're coming into the classroom. Um, I was uh, my question would be: Is that something that we would be able to do prior um, to school start starting? Since we are doing distance learning, where we just set up an appointment with a with a with a um, student and start doing the assessments early. Um, and you know, and just from here, you know, just reading all of the emails that we received and talking with people and things, I think that the one thing that we have to really um, keep in mind this year for this entire year is, as a board and as a and as a, as a as a school district, is that we that we have clear expectations, kind of from the top down, um, accountability, and absolutely a must is communication with our parents at this point. Um, 
I am excited about the new year. Um, it's definitely going to be challenging. Um, I want to thank the parents for taking this challenge on with us. I, we don't, at this point, we don't have the choice as far as what we would like to do with our students as far as in-person or distance learning. Um, so I think that we just need to all, um, I always say, to, you know, is just always be kind to each other and really, you know, put your self in place of another of, a, of another person as far as what they're going through and and that's something that i've really tried to do throughout the summer just hearing the notes and things um, so i would like to thank everyone again and i really want to thank the parents and the students for moving forward with all of this and it is and it is going to be tricky and um, i i think that by, by all of us working together we're going to get through this we'll get through this difficult time thank you maria thank you Jeannie. Thank you, Julio. Um, I'm wondering if you could uh, speak to us next. Sure. I think um, previous board members have already covered a lot of the sentiment that I have as far as what's happening. But I mean, overall, for me, as um, you know, it's still the the number one priority is the health and safety and the comfort level of um, of those most involved, which is going to be our our children. Our teachers, our staff, the one, the people that are going to be, you know, day to day uh, uh, in school once once uh, we move into either hybrid or uh, daily instruction. Um, I know it's challenging as a parent, um, uh, you know, and more so for parents that are uh, working parents and single parents. Um, you know, they're going to be facing a great a greater challenge and stress than than some of than some other parents, and so. I think it's important to, to recognize that you know that those families will need additional support in any way that either the district or the community can help. Um, I know it's not going to be easy, but I also believe that um, the way that we kind of handle ourselves as parents and community members is, is going to really teach our children, um, you know, how to respond as well. So if, if we're patient and we're resilient and we're flexible, um, then the then the kids are going to mo more than likely follow our lead. Um, and in the end, I think it's going to just allow us to teach. It's going to be a teachable moment for our for our kids, um, just to be resilient and strong-minded. Some of the things that we, you know that the district's already implementing, you know, to be resilient and 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 to work with our with work with our kids already. Um, and also, just looking at this as an opportunity uh, as our as our community, um, we've obviously already seen some of that work that's happening between the district, the community. Having those conversations, having that input is, is really important. And I just feel like that's gonna help build a stronger community working together, um, you know, sharing ideas, collaborating, and whether it's through a computer screen, um, you know, six feet apart or wearing a mask, I think it's it's gonna happen one way or the other. And I think it's important to, to, to stay focused on that. Um, I also believe that just uh, our district um, uh, is just doing a, a, a really good job as far as the position that they've been put in. Obviously, the leadership of the superintendent, the administrators, um, teachers, the staff, everyone that's kind of been working uh, this summer to get us prepared to, for, to open in the fall. Um, I'm very confident and I believe that the district is going to do what's best for, for the students and staff. Um, and that's really all that I can ask for as a parent and a community member is that they're looking at every angle of this, looking at every scenario, uh, getting all the guidance, all the information and working their way through it. Um, I know that this wasn't work that they were expecting to do this summer, um, but I think it's very necessary that they continue to, to, to go through the process and have that um, community input. So again, I just wanna um, reiterate that I'm grateful for, for the staff and all the additional hours and work that has been put into this, so that's it. Thank you, Julio. Lisa? Unmute, Thanks. Lisa. Yeah, I'm unmuted. Thank you. Um, before I uh, share some comments, I wanted to ask one question because we did answer the public comments that were that came in via the meeting. Will those submitted via email attached to the agenda will they receive answers as well? That was one question I had. Um, and then um, uh, going in, I you know, I it's easy to say ditto when you kind of go towards the end, but that's not the way I work. So um, um, I do also want to start off by giving a huge thanks um, to our staff and to our parents and to our community. But I think um, 
you know, when you look at a presentation of slides that's, you know, 50 pages, I don't think most people realize what that represents and the amount of hours that our staff has been consumed, whether they sit in their office or they sit at home with trying to figure out how to best serve and educate our children. It is an astounding task. I look at the slides that in particular, it makes me think about the slides that Andy presented. All of that was narrowed down to what, three slides? That's just, it's, it's an absurd amount of work and task to get our schools ready uh, to be safe and serve our students. So a huge, huge thank you to all of you. Um, and um, you know, as we move forward, as Dr. Wilson is fond of saying, there's not a period that comes after the phrase of continual improvement in education. And I want to say that with remote learning, there's also not a period after that. Um, we are continuing to problem solve. I, I want parents to know that problem solving is goes on by the by the hour. Um, you know, so know that there it's going to be continuous. What seems like you know we've solved one problem this week may be a different problem next week. So know that the staff is continually problem solving. Um, it's going to be important to remain flexible. Uh, you know, again, what happens one week is going to be maybe different the next week. Um, and we have to practice collaboration. I mean, this is between all you know, stakeholders. That's between our district staff, our teachers, and our parents. Um, you know, we've, it's gotta be collaborative to be successful. Um, I do, I, do um, I am very concerned about accountability, learning what we have about what happened in the spring. Um, and I really wanna strive that accountability, accountability really rises to the top both for our students so that they know what's expected for them, that they know what the deadlines are, when their things are due, that they're, they're, they're accountable for showing up, whether it's on a Zoom or in another method, but they have accountability. And I wanna see that the staff, their teachers demand accountability of them. And I want the teachers held accountable. I want to see consistency across all four school sites, across all grade levels, no holes to say that, sixth grade is missing this, but 10th grade is doing that, and third grade did this, but first grade didn't. It, we need to have it consistent and accountable across the board. Um, I also wanna remind our families that, you know, this is a partnership between the school and all of our families. You know, the schools, you know, we all have a role in the responsibility to model and practice behaviors related to the pandemic. Um, you know, when school resumes in person, whether it's hybrid or in person, you know, the schools only have your children for X amount of time of the day. So this is a partnership, families. You have to hold up your end of the deal as well to help us stay in school. Um, so we need your help to knowing to, to help, you know, help with the practices that have been put in place. Um, and then again, I want to just, you know, remain hang on, remain vigilant about communication. Um, you know, I'm super sensitive when there are claims that we're not being transparent or we haven't communicated enough. I still firmly believe that communication is a two-way street. Um, we have to provide it and people, are, people can ask. You know, if you can't find it, then you need to reach out and ask. We have more than enough, you know, our district staff is there to help especially during these uncertain times. I mean, it's very, we realize that it's hard, but please know that we want to be there to communicate for you, but you've got to help communicate and look for the answers in the right spots. Um, and sometimes that means going to the school sites, not to your neighbors, because they are the people that are going to provide you with the accurate information. Um, and I think, you know, um, as soon as we can get back to it, we all want to be there. There's no doubt about that. So I, I'm hopeful that we can get there. And I just, you know, I want to thank everybody again for giving their time to get us to where we are now. I, I, I also, um, you know, I approve of these models going forward. We, our hands are tied to a degree right now. So we have to start in phase one. But I'm hopeful that the school year will look different as soon as it possibly can. So thank you to everybody again. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Lisa. Joe, would you like to make a comment? Yes. Joe, our student board representative. We yeah. want to hear your voice, Joe. 
No, I, I, again, I want to reiterate what all the board members and said and thank not only the district staff, but the community for being here today, for being here to present this information and to listen to this information and to respond. But, you know, I have to say, I, I did my junior year much differently than I thought I would, and I'm going into my senior year much differently than I thought I would. And I think it really comes down to we need to be flexible. This is not something that any of us foresaw, you know, Dr. Wilson's words ring in my ear when we ended school on March 13th. We really thought it was going to be for those two weeks, and we thought everything was going to go back to normal. Here we are in, I don't even know what month it is, July, and we're having these conversations, and I think it's just, you know, we need to be flexible. We need to communicate. I'm going to say to all the community members here, if you have something to say, please say it. As Trustee Pelosi said communication is a two-way street. We understand your concerns. We have lived through this. You know, I was, I'm a student. I understand what all the students are going through. Looking at the last, sem at the last semester and trimester, I know that we can do better. One of the public comments said we have a moral obligation to do better. We are here for the students. We're talking about loss of learning. We're talking about social, uh, social emotional support. We have to do better, you know? But then again, this is such a complicated issue. We also have to factor in, we want our teachers to feel safe. We don't want them to be distracted with, you know, all of these other different things that are going on. We're committed to education. Let's give all of our stakeholders, let's create an environment where education can thrive and learning can be sustained. And I just, you know, I just, I think we can do better, but it's going to take flexibility. It's going to take empathy. It's going to take sympathy. And so, you know, this is the first step, having these conversations, setting up these dialogues. And I think it's important that we have these conversations at the district level, at the site level, at the department level, and then parents to students, students to teachers. I think it's important that we keep this going. But again, it also, it all depends on flexibility, on engagement. And so I implore everyone here to don't stop. Keep asking questions. Keep making your voice heard. This goes for everyone. And I just want to, I would want to end this by thanking all of you because this is such an, you know, uncharted territory. And we each have our duty as administrators, as board members, as students, as parents, as teachers, to do what we can to get through this together. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, I would like to um, make a few comments myself. Um, again, a lot of people have said things that um, I was going to say and I'm not going to repeat them. I'm gonna to touch on a few uh, other um, points that I'd like to just uh, let our community know and understand. Um, we have done a fantastic job Andrea Stubbs and Mary Lou Wilson, they have done a great job on securing PPE equipment. And we are lucky, very, very lucky to be in a district that can afford the precautionary measures that we have. So many districts are not in this situation. So many districts cannot afford it. We have purchased, the, the list is amazing. And I just remember the words of Barbara Dondero, our our school nurse who, who is a registered nurse, uh, how, how happy she was to see the list of PPE equipment that we have been able to procure for our students and staff. And, and we're very lucky as a district. We're very lucky as a district to be able to have the small class sizes that will make our students and teachers safe. Many districts do not even have the option of ever going to a, a full day uh, or a, a five day a week system. Many school districts are looking at remote learning for the entire year with no chance of ever leaving remote learning. So I, um, I really think that we have to, at the same time, uh, we have to look at how challenging it's gonna be how we're gonna to have to work together, but we also have to be grateful for the situation that we are in as a district. We are so much luckier and we have to remember that, that, that what we have is a gift that, that most school districts do not have. It's a, it's, 
the resources, the parent resources, the parent involvement, the community involvement, we can all work together to make this a workable educational and special year for our students. I just think that so many things that we did in the last, um, in the last few months of last year, we, we have some learning uh, uh, experiences that we can take with us. I think there were a lot of wonderful um, events that were social distancing events that were the parades or the or the high fives or or the uh, graduation or um, or promotion ceremonies that were done as drive bys we we can take those experiences on and into the next year as well um, in addition, I, I just like to um, again ask the rest of the board if we would like to have any more deliberation on this issue and if we should open it up again, would anyone else like to provide further comments, questions? I want to make sure that um, everyone is clear that our plans are going to be a guideline. They will be flexible. Uh, exact minutes and times of start might might change by a few minutes we have to factor in how how lunches will occur but this is going to be our plan going forward and and i think that our district and our administration has done a fantastic job it's been a lot of work no one has gone on summer vacation really um, without being even when they're on vacation or have a day off, they're still on their phone and on their emails constantly. So, um, so I'd like to again open it up to the board members to see if anyone has further comments, questions, or would like to discuss any issues further. President Haug, this is Dr. Wilson. Would you like staff to respond to the questions that were asked by board members? Of course, sorry. Okay, so the first question that I heard, and Mr. Heller, this is coming to you. How long would it take to transition to the in-person model? Uh, well, I think under the governor's orders, they we would have a 14-day notice of when we would transition. But but the the three di the the three different models were designed to be able to transition on a on a day's notice if we needed to. So. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if I'm answering that question exact. I mean, the, the, we could transition in a day, but I think we would have enough foresight from the, the state to be uh, looking ahead if, if we were released, you know, to uh, not monitoring uh, in our county uh, today, then we could say two weeks from, you know, a certain date, we would begin in-person instruction. So I hope that answers that. Is that Jeannie, was that your question? Yes, it was, and that does okay. answer. Thank you very okay. much, thank you. And then um, Mary, Alan, um, what are some of the strategies that you and your, uh, the principals have been talking about with regards to mitigating learning loss? Well, I think, I think that's huge uh, because we certainly, first we need to do an assessment. So we will be conducting assessments to answer another question at the beginning of the year to determine where we're at, knowing that there's always some bump down because of summer, but we will be looking at that to see our consistency. We've been doing map assessments for several years, so we have a pattern on each student. And so we will be providing those assessments at the beginning of the year. And then provide at that point, we will determine who needs small group, where's our differentiating going to be, how can we support those students that are English learners, homeless, um, our students that have special needs. So we are, we are definitely having those conversations and there'll be built in lesson designs for that. And Mr. Heller, can you address the, the time factor, I believe on the remote schedule, as well as the hybrid schedule you have, and also the in-person access for students to receive additional support? Um, so can you re clarify that question? Just so With I'm regards clear. to um, mitigating the learning loss and assessments, um, I just wanted to oh. confirm that the schedules that we have uh, allocate time for special students with special needs, whether that be a special education student, an English learner, um, uh, somebody who is at promise struggling. Right. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah, that was 
that's been important not only from our end, but from the SHTA uh, as we worked on the schedules collaboratively that we did find opportunities for teachers to connect with uh, you know, our vulnerable student populations and, and ensure that they have time built into the day to connect with the students to further them uh, you know, so they don't get further behind. Uh, we wanna make sure that they keep pace and, and have access to their teachers in a, in a time frame that, that works for them to uh, ask further questions and get that individual support that they're gonna need. So again, those are built into the every schedule and at, at every level is to make sure that uh, time is allocated and it's done in a manner that uh, students will, will be able to access their teachers. And then, Mr. Heller, can you also um, affirm the, the notion that there will be clear expectations and accountability for students and teachers? Yes, uh, by, you know, having schedules helps. Um, you know, in the fall or in the spring of last year, we didn't have a design schedule. We, we left it up to teachers to, to schedule students. And um, I think the notion that we're going to have a daily attendance and, and we have a, a regular pattern of scheduled time to follow really will ensure that that accountability not only for the students but you know the time for uh, in, a, in, a, in a school day for all parties. Thank you and and also the fact that we are while we're still in that pandemic and we're still in the COVID-19 event or crisis it's a much more of a planned time frame now as opposed to it was in uh, in March when we were truly in crisis. With regards to communication and that expectation for ongoing communication, I, um, you know, that is uh, the role of Erica Madrigal and myself. Um, and if you um, have any questions about COVID-19 and our school district, our website is uh, full of information from, from our staff and from the county office and from public health. And uh, we'll continue with text messages when it needs to be short and sweet email messages when we have more information, phone calls if, uh, if warranted, information sessions as we have conducted. Um, you, you know, parents are our partner and we need to keep you um, updated and involved. So communication will continue um, and, and increase when needed uh, and move forward. Um, uh, Mary, I think maybe this one would be for you. How can we provide additional support for our families in crisis? And, and before you answer, I want to remind everyone that food is available to any child in the city under the age of 18 or if they are enrolled in our schools. Currently, um, meal packages are going out Monday mornings from 9.30 to 10.30 uh, at the high school, in front of the high school office on Grayson. Students who did not have access to um, the internet were checked, they received uh, hotspots and have access to the internet. All of our families kept their devices throughout the summer. Uh, and so those pieces are in place and have been in place from the very beginning. Mary, um, other thoughts with regards to mental health services and or other crises? Yes, as, as Andy stated earlier, we will have an increase with our counseling, mental health counseling for our students uh, this year with our contract with Up Valley Family Center. Also, Napa County Mental Health has been working with several providers, including the schools, to have uh, increased access for parental support, mental health support, uh, as well as student access. And there is a 24-hour hotline that students can access and there's certainly a line that parents can access if they're in crisis. So Napa has a lot of wraparound services happening right now that will continue into the fall and throughout this year. And it is on our webpage and I believe it's under our resources. Thank you, Mary. And then President Haug, would you like me to address the, um, the public comments that were posted on the district website, on the board docs? Well, uh, some of the public comments did not meet the guidelines as to addressing um, the board uh, agenda item. So we will not be addressing those public comments that were um, that were sent to the board that did not uh, did not meet the criteria of a public comment for this meeting. Um, the instructions were very clear. You had to be discussing our plan. So. Um, so the, there are some uh, other public comments that were there and, uh, and some 
were already read um, during the, the live public comment, but I would like you to address the others, please. Thank you. Thank you. Many of the, a couple of them were read. Many of the questions as I looked at all of them have been answered through the presentation. Um, I did find a couple of pieces that I thought were um, slightly different and had not been addressed. Mr. Heller, there was a question about teacher evaluations and would those continue? Uh, that's to be further discussed at a, uh, another time with our uh, SHTA, and so I, I can't provide any final answer today. Thank you. Uh, Mary and or Chris, uh, there was a question with regards to looking at the schedules. A parent was concerned that perhaps the required instructional minutes were not being um, fulfilled. Uh, current, the... the um, the new instructional minutes that have been amended uh, has 180 for elementary and 240 for uh, middle and high school. I think maybe it's 230 for middle school and 240 for high school. So uh, the schedules have been developed with that in mind. Thank you. Uh, then another question was about the virtual program and what does that look like? And, and I'm asking that one more time only so that you can reaffirm that more information will be following. More information will be following. <laughs> um, there was a concern um, listed that the uh, Napa County Public Health uh, is requiring masks for all employees and grades three through 12 and not for TK2. And um, while I understand that concern, um, we certainly can recommend masks for TK through two. Um, we also know that it's very challenging and difficult for uh, five-year-olds to keep a mask on all, all day. And so the cohort model, it, um, keeping the students in a small group with the same instructor um, throughout the day um, is a method to mitigate that concern with regards to the masks um, and ensuring that the teachers are are staying six feet away. Um, our teachers have addressed the concern about a cloth mask covering their face and not the, the students not being able to see them. And that's why um, Andy has purchased the face shields with the cloth on the bottom of the, of the face shields so that they're actually tucking that into their clothing so that um, uh, no uh, uh, virus potentially could be spread. So um, I, I understand the concerns on the part of, of all of the community and um, we'll continue to move forward with public health recommendations and do what we can to ensure safety. There was one last question on the virtual enrollment and if, if they chose to um, go into the virtual program for the school year, would that impact their enrollment in the school district? And just to affirm that we would be in partners with the virtual program, uh, attendance would be taken and fed into our ARIES um, program. Uh, and so the, their enrollment would be static. You, were, you would continue to be enrolled in the St. Helena Unified School District. There were other um, public comment that were letters, not questions, recommendations around reading um, some different articles from different doctors, pediatricians, uh, and uh, using creative methods to open school. And, and certainly we will do what we can to, um, to get our students in person as quickly as we possibly can based on the public health guidelines. Thank you, President Haug. Dr. Wilson. Uh, may I ask a question? Um, on one of the public comments, it was about, well, the teachers are instructing remotely. Will they have access to their classrooms? Uh, yes, um, we plan to uh, have teachers all, Currently, we have our entire custodial grounds, maintenance and operations team on campuses preparing for opening of the school year. And um, I did receive uh, uh, guidance from Dr. Relucio that our teachers can be in their classrooms if needed. Okay, or thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So again, just to clarify, it is possible that some classes uh, or many of the classes the teacher will be teaching from the classroom remotely uh, when practicable or when possible. Mr. Heller, do you want to reaffirm that? Uh, yes. The answer to that is yes. When practicable. Okay. 
Um, board members, are there further questions or comments? I have one more question um, regarding, ahead, regarding um, if we are in daily instruction, what is the policy going to be around um, par parents being um, or dropping off at school? Are parents going to be allowed to get down to drop off, obviously wearing the mask and everything, or, or is it going to be just drop off only? Uh, I mean, obviously that with the access to, for parents, you know how sometimes parents will want to drop them off or is that going to be allowed or is it going to just be drop off at the curb only? When you, I think what you're suggesting or asking, um, Julio, is can parents stay at the school, potentially volunteer, or be on the playground with students? Is that what you're asking? Uh, well, both, yeah, both, I guess both, because yeah, that component, but also too, just when, you know, a lot of parents, especially at the primary level, will get down and walk them to, walk the kids to the classroom and then, um, you right. know, not necessarily volunteer, but be on campus. So I just kind of a question regarding what, what that'll look like if it were um, daily instruction or even hybrid, if, you, if there's any information. Yeah, really good question. Um, so the public health document that Napa County and the um, public Napa County Health and Napa County Office of Education have developed um, is uh, recommending that we limit access to the schools by um, addition, other, other adults, parents, volunteers, and whatnot. In addition, it's very possible, depending on the time period and where we are within this pandemic, that um, grade levels will enter the schools from different locations. Uh, so my, I, I, my answer is I don't know, and my sense is that it's going to be very limited. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Any other further questions? I have one. Go ahead, Joe. Question. Um, I think it was brought up a little bit during public comment. And I so now that these conceptual models have been brought forward, I know that this body will make a decision, but there are, are there any plans to reach? I know that teachers were a part of building this, but are there any plans to reach back out to teachers, back out to parents, say now that these conceptual models whatever decision this body makes, just kind of gathering some final thoughts before we go into the school year. Is there any plan to reach back out to those respective groups? Dr. Wilson? Sure, and Mr. Heller, if you'd like to uh, add to this answer as well, I'm ha happy to have you add. Yes, so I have been um, uh, taping uh, video messages recently to update the community. Um, and I believe Erica has it on the schedule for me to do one tomorrow um, to update the community on the decisions being made today. Um, in addition to that, uh, Mr. Heller is in constant contact with uh, Mr. Farrell and also um, Mrs. Avina, our classified um, union president. So uh, constant conversation. Um, we did have Zoom meetings this week with all of our teachers. Uh, I'm sorry, last week, today's Monday. Uh, we had Zoom meetings with our teachers last week um, and uh, that gave us lots of beneficial information and we'll continue to meet with all parties um, you know, to keep people abreast of the situation and what's happening. Here very soon, those Zoom meetings will move to the principal's responsibility as opposed to, uh, to the district staff as our principals will be coming back to, to join our team here pretty quickly while working during this time as well. Great, thank Heller, you. Heller, did I miss any aspect of that question? Okay. Great, thank you. Board members, any final questions or comments? Thank you. Board members, is there a motion to approve the TK-12 learning models as recommended as a conceptual models as presented? I'll make that motion. Is there a second? I'll make, I'll second that. Uh, Dr. Wilson, will you call the roll? Yes. Trustee Browdy? Aye. Trustee Conwell? Aye. Trustee Olguin? Aye. Trustee Kerr? Aye. Trustee Pelosi? Aye. Trustee Haug? Aye. Motion carried. So now we are on to item 
5A. So, uh, Dr. Wilson, um, this is uh, this is a um, uh, reaffirmation of our resolution. Would you like to um, explain it a little bit for our um, community members who might be hearing about this for the first time? Sure. Uh, I believe it was during the April board meeting. I brought forward this emergency resolution that allows the superintendent to make decisions in a quick manner given an emergency situation. This is pertaining to COVID-19 and um, you know, allowing me to, uh, without uh, calling an emergency board meeting to take any actions that I need to take to ensure the safety of our students and our, um, our employees in our community. Uh, it has a number of, of ed codes and safety codes that are involved in, in this resolution, and certainly it's never a resolution that I wanted to have to put into place or recommend to be put into place, um, and yet here we are. Uh, I bring it back to you today, um, not because it had a, a deadline, an end date on it. In fact, it was until further notice. I bring it back to you today in the event that something changes uh, in a moment's notice and I'm required to make decisions for the safety of our students and our, our employees. And so I would recommend that you reaffirm this today and we would put a fresh date on it, um, knowing that uh, we will do everything we can to um, ensure our students and our staff are safe and that education is at the forefront of our work. Uh, Ms. Madrigal, was there any public comment on this agenda item? There was no public comment. Thank you. Uh, is there any current public comment on this agenda item? Okay, thank you. Um, then, uh, board members, do we have any uh, questions or comments? No, I do not. I have no questions. Julio and Jeff, Joe? No questions, thank you. No questions. No questions. Thank you. Thank you. So um, just to clarify more for our um, people that are attending virtually today, that are, our community members and families, um, for example, we would be able to enter into a contract with um, with a virtual academy uh, in a timely fashion um, with this resolution in place. Is that correct, Dr. Wilson? Correct. Thank you. Now, um, sorry, I'm just oh, you know, my uh, screen. Go I'm, ahead. I'm sorry, Maria, I have a question. So as far as that, then then the, then a contract would come our way then in consent or in the in a future board meeting, is that correct? Absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you. Any further questions? So is there a motion to approve the reaffirmation resolution 19-19 as presented? I'll make a motion to approve. Do I have a second? I'll second. Dr. Wilson, will you please call the roll? Yes, Trustee Browdy? Aye. Trustee Conwell? Aye. Trustee Olguin? Aye. Trustee Kerr? Aye. Trustee Pelosi? Aye. Trustee Haug? Aye. Motion carried. So um, finally, we come to the end of our meeting. Would like to thank all of our community members, parents, teachers, and anyone who has uh, watched our meeting today. I would like to thank you for your input, your patience, and I know that what, if we work together, we can get through this together. It's going to be difficult, but I truly believe that if any community can make it, we can. We're gonna be patient, we're gonna be empathetic, and we're gonna be understanding of each other and 
understanding of all the different roles that we have to play. Is there a motion to adjourn today's meeting? I'll make a motion to adjourn today's meeting. Is there a second? I'll second. Dr. Wilson, would you like to call the roll? Yes, of course. Trustee Browdy? He's Aye. already left. There he is. Aye. Trustee Conwell? Aye. Trustee Olguin? Aye. Trustee Kerr? Aye. Trustee Pelosi? Aye. President Haug? Aye. Motion carried. Meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, community. Thank you, parents. Thank, thank you, you to our translators. Thank you, our translators, and thank you to our administrative staff and Dr. Wilson. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody. Too. Happy you too. Bye. Bye. Bye.